What is going on, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? You are on the sidelines with the sideline guys. And today, people, today, we're back again, once again, with an MMA edition of the show. I couldn't be more excited to be joined once again by my esteemed co-host, uh, my brother in Negrongness, the, the man that works harder than, than most um, migrants in New York City do, uh, my guy, the inimitable, the one and only, Sean Negrong. How's it going, brother? Hey, man, it's going well. Glad to uh, be back doing this. It's It's been a good minute. We needed this minute. But now, you know, I'm very excited for what we have coming up. You know, we're changing a couple things here. This is going to be a very fun time. We are, what is it, uh, less than two weeks away from UFC 300. This is a very fun time in the UFC MMA community. So I'm very, very excited to, uh, to do this. Hell yeah, man. We got a lot to look forward to a lot to look back at too. Uh, but most importantly, uh, really excited to, to have a card, right? We have a fight card to break down in full something that we have been able to do for a little bit now. And once, like you said, really happy to be back. We've got UFC housecape 11,000 and 10 Brendan Allen. Versus Chris Curtis, number two. Um, we're going to be going bottom to top, as we always do, just breaking down every single one of these fights, giving our thoughts, giving our opinions. Uh, but before we do that, we've been we've been gone for a little bit, right? So I think it's only right that we remind the folks how they can find us, most importantly, across all the social medias. So make sure that you're following the brand at OTS Media Co. on all social media platforms. OTS Media on YouTube. Make sure you're you're subscribed. Make sure that you're hitting that notification bell so you never miss all the good stuff that we're going to be bringing, delivering straight to your ears. And then, of course, you could find me at Negrong MMA on Twitter as well as TikTok, the site formerly known as X. Well, for, currently known as X. Uh, I'm always going to call it Twitter. I don't care. Follow me there, Negrong MMA. Going to be doing a lot more um, activity after this show so you got a lot to look forward to uh where can the people find you sean and your beautiful website that i am excited to be making my debut on by the end of this week so can you please let the people know about what you've got going on wow you heard you heard that right that was breaking news right there confirmed um, confirmed. that is that's good i've said know. it before i've said it before but this time it's real okay <laughs> that's good that's good that's the most important part um now you guys can find me uh, on Twitter or X, whatever, on uh, at Sean Egger on twenty six, and uh, at BS Reports. Uh, that's on my Twitter as well, or bsreports.org. That's the website that he will be making his debut on. If you guys ever are trying to write, you know, get involved in sports in any way, uh, shoot me a shout on Twitter or you know, email me there. My my emails are below on the website, and uh, I'll help you get started. Yeah, man, this guy is the pod, uh, one of the many pod fathers out there and, and someone that I can't believe, right? Someone that I can't believe how far we've come as a unit, right? Despite not being here for you guys, uh, but the consistency we've been able to show before this little spat and what we have in store for you, man. Once again, I couldn't ask for a better uh, heterosexual life partner than my guy, Sean Negron. But with all that being said... Let's get right into the fucking fights, ladies and gentlemen. The reason why we're here, our first fight of the night, we have a bantamweight tilt between the newly minted Melissa Tanya Mullins and one Nora Cornolio. This fight takes place at women's bantamweight with no Melissa Tanya Mullins being a minus 380 favorite against the plus 280 Nora Corn Cornolio. I will take the reins here with our first fight of the night. It feels good to say all this, man. I'm, I'm fucking pumped right now. Um, formerly, Melissa Dixon, of course, made her UFC debut in her last fight. Um, and Nora Corn Cornolio did the exact same thing. And both were able to come away with the win, right? So we've got some momentum for some women's bantamweights in the year of our Lord 2024, Sean. This, this doesn't even sound appropriate this doesn't sound right for what we have come to know this division to be like um i say all that to say i'm not particularly excited about either of these women's prospects in this division but uh as far as this matchup goes um i thought 
I was very interested to see the odds and how wide they were. Now, I admittedly am going to be leaning towards Melissa Tanya Mullins, formerly Melissa Dixon. I'm going to be picking her in this fight, uh, and I will lay out those reasons why. But I actually do feel that Nora Cornolio has a really strong, striking upside in this fight. I love... Melissa Dixon's style, she fights very within herself, right? Something that we didn't get to see in last week's main event between one of my favorite fighters, Aaron Blanchfield and Manon Fierro. Um, Melissa Dixon is someone that stays behind her feet, right? We, we The punches are coming before the chin is arriving, right? That was something that we unfortunately saw from Aaron Blanchfield in that last fight, just rushing forward constantly in a way that uh, was not conducive uh, to landing strikes. I think I really like the way Melissa Dixon sets up her strikes, uh, despite not being necessarily known as a striker. Um, I think Nora Cornolio, a lot of the same, but just much smoother on the feet, has a speed advantage from what, what I see on the tape. A little bit smaller, of course. Um but I think the way that Melissa Dixon ultimately wins this fight is by mixing it up in the grappling. I think Nora Canolio can find herself in advantageous positions in the clinch. So it's all about not getting caught in that in-between phase when hunting for these takedowns. But I think ultimately, once Melissa Tanya Mullins gets to work those damn takedowns, I think she should be able to control this fight relatively easily. If this fight stays on the feet, like I'm going to be very transparent about this. Um, I think you might as well live bet Nora Cornolio because if she can't get her down, I think it's going to be a hard night for Melissa. Um, but all things considered from where I saw Nora's grappling in that previous fight with Jos Jocelyn Edwards, uh, that fight, looking back on it, actually was a lot more exciting and technical than I would have gave him credit for off of memory. Um but ultimately, I think uh, the grappling upside lies with Melissa, and that's why I'm picking her. How you feeling, Sean? Um, you know what? To be honest with you, I'm picking I'm picking Nora here. Um, I I feel that Nora's fight against Jocelyn was uh, in her last fight was pretty impressive to me. Like I felt like the striking was really there, and I feel like that's going to be sort of an issue for um, for Melissa. I think Melissa. In, in trying to do this constant like grapple game and take her down is going to be an issue with uh with the Muay Thai skills that that Nora has and I think that's going to cause problems I think it's going to be constant trying to grapple it's like a obviously we're getting a simple classic striker versus grappler sort of matchup here but I feel that Nora can keep this standing and I feel with how Melissa struggled against, um, I think it was Irina, uh, in her last fight. And Irina doesn't have great stand-up, and she was still getting pieced up pretty good. And even though she came out with the win, I still wasn't put away of like, okay, she's got, you know, I, I was okay with her win there. I wasn't built on that. So I feel that Nora will do everything she can to keep this fight standing and to keep the distance, use her Muay Thai, avoid the grapple, and I do think that she'll take this one uh, and keep this one standing by unanimous decision. Hey, man, I really like that. I think we agree as far as where the striking skills lie. Um, I think Melissa might be able to survive there a little longer than than you might think, though. Like, I feel like her her ability to keep things rangy uh, in these exchanges, despite not being necessarily comfortable striking. Right. Like you see that in t in in moments, but she's a very well trained fighter. Right. And I think. In those moments, uh, that's what's going to set the difference apart. But I love the analysis, man. My guy, my guy's ready for the comeback, goddammit. Our next fight, we have, and this is a name that I've struggled with. This is a name that I've tried really hard to make sure that I get correctly. We've got a middleweight fight between Dylan Budka. I almost went Dick Butkus on you guys. Going up against Cesar Almeida, the name that is made prominent because obviously... This is someone who has another kickboxing rivalry with one Alex Pereira this time instead of Israel Adesanya. This is Alex Pereira 2.0, right? We're getting that guy in to set up this fight later on. Let's see if this is all going to work out. Uh, this is a really interesting fight, and I can't wait to hear how you feel about it, Sean. Why don't you take us to the promised land? Yeah, that, that's why I'm taking Caesar here, you know. He's got that win versus... Uh, versus um, 
what's his name Pereira what was it 10 plus years ago now but you know I know he's a he's a vet you know he's got plenty of you know first round knockouts to to his repertoire here but I think um you know it, it's easy to look past his prime but I'd like to think that uh he's coming in here for a reason I think his striking is a lot stronger than Dylan's and I think this is one where Caesar will push a lot of pressure early here and, you know, maybe stay a little laid back to start off the first 10, 15 seconds. But I think with a lot of feints, the, you know, the kickboxing will be there for him. And I could see this one being not as uh, exciting as people expect this to be because of obviously the history with him and Pereira and all that nonsense. But I do think that this is going to be a good fight. I just think Cesar takes it. I think it's closer than people think. But I think Almeida with the kickboxing and the distance – and the constant striking here will will be more than enough to uh, weigh the judges. Whew. Damn, man. We're, we're, we're coming right out of the shoot here. Both back to back underdogs. <laughs> yeah, both, both, uh, both picking opposite sides of the coin here, man. I want to be a, a part of the Cesar Almeida train. And you know why, right? This man trains at Extreme Couture, right? I, I love this gym. I love, I love everything about this gym. Uh, and everyone that comes out of it. So that that's exciting, right? Um, I think Dylan Butker deserves some fucking credit, right? Some fucking respect on his name. Because I thought his performance in the Dana White Contender Series was actually pretty well put together for someone at this stage of their career. Um, I think he has a very grappling forward style, uh, which originally uh, Cesar Almeida was set to face Josh Fremd, which is a Di very different grappling style as far as dimensions, right? Uh, a much rangier grappler wrestler in Josh Fremd. But Dylan Butka, I think, is just an absolute fucking unit, right? From a, a, a team, demolition fight team, that isn't really heralded for having many uh, key cornerstone UFC fighters, right? A lot of up-and-coming amateurs and, and fighters that aren't necessarily uh, burning the door down with their record, right? But... I think his game is very uh, disciplined in what he's going out there to accomplish. And in this style matchup specifically, obviously the the Caesar Almeida button exists, right? We, we could just get cracked at any point and it could be over, right? And I got to be accepting of that outcome. Uh, but I think Dylan Bucker can take a shot based on a lot of the fights that I've seen of his. And I think his grappling focused game where he's constantly hunting for takedowns and honestly getting them in very stylish fashion, um, I think is going to not only lead to fatiguing Cesar Almeida, uh, but could potentially lead to a TKO finish on the ground just with the way he uh, is, once again, so dogged in this position. Now, I think that's why he's the favorite. I can understand, um, obviously, why you're going with Cesar Almeida because of the, tang the tangible elements, right? This is a striker versus grappler scenario. And on short notice, being a grappler, uh, that's just not a good look uh, generally. But I, I do believe styles make fights. And with the absolute tank uh, that Dylan Bucca is, I am confident in making that pick here. So I'm going the opposite way. Uh, but once again, I can definitely see why you're going that way. Next up, I'm really excited for this bantamweight matchup between Gene Matsumoto and Dan Argetta, one of Sean's very own um, dynasty fighters. <laughs> Wait, yeah. what was that? I didn't hear you. What was that? I said fuck. <laughs> <laughs> so wait, did you forget? Or, or was, uh, no, is it just I knew. a reminder? Yeah, okay. No, I knew. Yeah, I knew. I saw the doc today and I was like, fuck. Because <laughs> I, I have a lot you. to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love that you're, you're going this route too because uh, I was really excited to watch the tape on this young bantamweight prospect that is Gene Matsumoto, 24 years old with a record of 14 and 0. Uh, something that you don't really see today in, in this Dana White contender series age. Uh, you do not see fighters that season. And man, um, this food would be too seasoned, bro. This this guy is really good. Like, I I wish I had the first pick. I think this guy is first pick worthy, right? As far as dynasty prospects go. I'm trying to plant some seeds here, Sean. I'm trying to plant some seeds. This guy is fucking good as a prospect. I think the fact that He's so heralded for his grappling skills, and the guy can go out there and beat the fuck out of you, too. Like, I'm really excited 
to see what's to come of this Brazilian prospect. Dan Argetta is a hard fight for anybody in this division. I just got to reiterate this. I think Dan Argetta is going to have a physicality advantage in this fight. And I think if he can lay that to bear, things are definitely going to get a lot more interesting. But even in a world where, let's say, round one is just Dan Argetta control, um, I think Gene is composed enough to come out in the second and third and really put put a game together around what he just felt in round one. Uh, once again, I hate to harken back to last week, but um, just that that fight is embedded in my brain with uh, Aaron Blanchfield and Manon Firo, where you you've approached the style of this fight a certain way and it hasn't paid off for you. And you just don't have another option. Like I think, G I think Gene Matsumoto has all the options when it comes to MMA and, and all the different skills to fall back on to find himself in a different fight in, in round two than he did in round one. If things start to go bad against someone, like I said, that is so physically imposing. So I think this fight isn't, as one-sided as the odds may suggest, uh, especially making your UFC debut, right? Um, but I have respect for the prospect that is Gene Matsumoto, and I'm picking him here. Yeah, I actually uh, I agree with you, and it's unfortunate because it's gonna be it's gonna be a tough one for me because I hate losing in Dynasty. It costs me more. Um, but yeah, now the thing is, is that when Dan fought Miles John in his last fight, I realized then that he has one of the worst striking I've ever seen. Damn. And, <laughs> and it just shows that he's so like pure only grappling. And because he's, you know, he's a bigger guy. So that's, that's why I think the odds are even remotely this close because he's just such a more dominant physically. And, and he's just going to be relying so solely on grappling but i think with matsumoto like being a, such a high level prospect and so easily can do both like or I shouldn't say both multiple things he could grapple he could strike he could wrestle he could do basically anything he's very 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 well rounded and i think that's going to be something where he's going to try to keep this fight standing and i think he's going to want to test his bag here in a way of like seeing how deep of water he can put Dan in striking, keeping it standing. And, you know, I think he'd be fine with the grappling against Dan. Maybe Dan's got the advantage there right now, but I think this is one where Gene's just going to absolutely love keeping this fight standing and just piece up Dan. I can see this. Honestly, I'm going to predict this right now. I see this going either first or second round TKO via punches. Whew. I love it, man. I love it. And once again, I, I just love that you went to that phrase that he's going to show his bag because you, you only develop that depth of skill by competing regularly and also competing against fighters that are good. Like the, the people that he's fought are not some, you know, s seven and six cans. Like the, these guys are, are up and coming fighters in their own right. And I think yeah, he didn't do the Khabib way. Like I get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Kalabib way. Hey, hey, yeah, hey this, this one's for you. All right. Remember that. Next time you come with this goat shit, uh, there's nobody that can be considered a goat who the majority of their record is people that are one in six, brother. That's not that's not okay. Happy, I, I'm right? not calling Kalabib fucking a goat. John Jones is the goat. It was Jay. It was Jay. Okay, it was Jay. <laughs> I, that's another fucking debate that we gotta have as well, because I completely disagree with that. I got a little bit of a hot take when it comes to my goat because I have a I actually respect the asterisks of MMA. Yeah, all things considered, else does, though, okay. all things considered, yeah, yeah, you might be right on that one. Uh, but gl glad to see that we both are um, eyes popped out for the talents that is Gene Matsumoto. Next up, Cynthia Calvillo on a strong five fight losing streak going up against Piera Rodriguez. Sean, I'm so excited because I get to just lower the draws while you talk about this fight. How you feeling? <laughs> Dude, why is this fight still happening? I I, I remember coming to you in this last one, and in, in, in Cynthia's last fight, and saying that's got to be it, right? Like that's the I it, I haven't seen anything in the last two fights, let's just say, that made me think, you know what, Cynthia could turn this around. I believe in her. It's done. I, I I'm very surprised the UFC kind of kept this uh, and kept her in on the roster. You know, when you can easily fill it up. Cynthia's time has come and gone. 
and I hate saying that because I hate I sound like a hater and I, I'm I do everything I can to not be except except to you. I love doing that to you. But it's for Cynthia, like her time has passed. She's slower than she ever was. She she's not reading it as, as fast as she once did. And I think Piera is just overall completely better now. Like and, and that's and she's on the come up. So this is a fight where I was surprised they even made this and like I don't want to break this down too much because I don't I don't really think this is much of a breakdown. I don't think Cynthia is going to be able to compete with Piera. I don't see this fight actually ending via TKO or anything like that or sub. I just do see a way that Piera just runs this through with 3027, maybe even a 3026 and finds this way of getting Cynthia the hell out of the UFC roster. I I I applaud her for being in the UFC this long, but having a five fight losing streak and none of them have come via title fight or anything like that. It's very hard to see how you're still here. And I think nothing changes, you know, come to Saturday. Dude, there's nobody that takes more pleasure from seeing fighters leave into the badlands than than my guy, Sean. I I love it. Um, I disagree with you a little bit as far as the uh, closeness of this fight. I think I am also leaning with Piera Rodriguez. I think the stylistically, the way that she holds herself on the feet, very, very low and rooted to the ground. It's actually an advantage against Cynthia Calvillo because of the way she attacks for her takedowns. I think she's going to be in position already to not only stuff, but to pummel and to put herself uh, advantageous uh, in advantageous positions in the grappling. Um, I don't really like Piera striking either, though. Like, I think she is also someone that kind of um, can get lost out there, right? Can can get lost in the sauce, and now we're just kind of looking at each other from afar. Um, I think there's a world where Cynthia Calvillo is able to put these five losses, these five straight losses behind her. But hey, don't don't forget, don't forget, two split decisions in the last two, right? So. It changes the perspective of a losing fighter on a losing streak. Hey, I, 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 if one person saw it the other way, I won that fight, right? So there's a different level of tuned inness, and I think, of course, her training, if I'm not mistaken, with Syndicate MMA now and making that change in her life uh, can only be good. Uh, but at the same time, man, I just feel like I don't think she's a step slower. I just think she never developed in the way that we thought she would and i think that's okay to admit right i feel like obviously when she had that streak on the pay-per-views back to back we all really got excited about her prospects because of what she was able to accomplish but man please i encourage you guys look back and remember who those people were uh and then and then you'll start to understand a little bit more i mean obviously going to a split with loopy feels good in theory uh, but I agree. I don't think there's anything really on. But paper you that... also lost and split to freaking Nina. So like, come on. <laughs> yeah, Nina I can't Marie, take a Nina serious drama. Though. Yeah, yeah, I can't <laughs> take it serious, bro. Come on. I know. I was about to say the exact same thing. I don't. I can't ever put myself in a position to 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 bet on her or pick her as an underdog, and especially all things considered, plus 130 is not a good enough number. So I agree with you, Piero Rodriguez it is. I don't like it, right? I'm not a fan of, of Piero Rodriguez prospects in this in this game, uh, but she's fighting out of a legit camp herself and obviously the more active of the two uh, in a positive way lately. So that is that. Next up, we've got Alatang Haley going up against Victor Hugo. Uh, the debuting. Am I am I mistaken in saying that the debuting Victor Hugo? I think you're right. I think this is his debut. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, I just got to make sure. I, so you saw. I'm very neurotic about these things. I knew I was. I knew I was right, but I. You just got to make sure. Um, Victor Hugo looked like an absolute uh war dog out there in his last fight at Dana White's Contender Series. Right. Things weren't necessarily always in his favor. Uh, but goddamn it, we pulled it out with a with a slick knee bar. Um, I like Alatang Haley, and I've talked to you about this a lot more than than most people, right? Um, I enjoy his game, and I think having experience at this level is is just absolutely huge. Now, I do admit, uh, Victor Hugo definitely poses a lot of danger zones for one Alatang Haley, um, especially on the ground and in the grappling. Hundred percent, I'm not mistaken by that. But I just feel like Victor Hugo is just there 
to be fucking cracked, brother. I, I really, I really do see that in the tape, and I just have irrational confidence that my guy Alatang Haley is gonna eventually pull this thing out because, man, the raw talent, right? The physical talent is there. It's just a matter of being able to bring it to bear on the night. And I think if there's any matchup for him to do it, there's any if there's any heart left in me to 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 continue supporting this man. Um, it's going to be in this fight. So fuck it. Give me Alatang Haley. This is a heart pick more than anything. Uh, but once again, if Victor Hugo goes out there and rips his arm off, I won't be surprised. How are you feeling, Sean? I feel these guys are complete opposite type fighters. I feel with Alatang, he's, you know, very robust with the striking. He has a very durable chin, but his vulnerability is clearly in the grapple game. And I feel with Hugo, he excels very well in the grapple while he's striking is kind of on the weaker side. I don't find his power to be that, uh, to be that forceful. I don't think he, his stand up is really that great. And I think that's where Alatan could clearly be, you know, the difference maker here, but I do see this way. I do see this fight going towards the grapple game, towards the wrestling and the takedown. And that's why it is. This was a, this was probably the toughest pick I had to make all night, mm. but I am very slimly, very, very slimly picking Victor Hugo here. This is a very, very tough fight. I, I was like 75% sure I was going to pick Alatang this morning. But while working, I was thinking about this fight, and I was like, I just think Hugo might be able to keep this on the ground. And if he keeps this on the ground, this is this can be very – quick you know on how much this favors hugo and you know i think it's it's one of those where if this is standing i clearly will go alatang but if not i think hugo takes this as soon as this goes into the grapple on the short side so give me hugo here let's keep it different dude i love the fact that you acknowledge that this was difficult for you because you picking a debuting fighter against someone with this much experience is just the opposite of who you are. So I know. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 assumed, I assumed we would be aligned on this one, but Hey, I love it. Uh, I, I won't be surprised if one of us end up drafting Victor Hugo too, despite how I kind of shit it on him a little bit. I, I think the, the areas in which he's strong is uh, good enough to warrant uh, some, some excitement about his prospects at this division. Yeah, I think he's still young. I think I just don't think he's at his 31? best self yet. At yeah, 31? but I'm saying young. Okay, first of all, we have plenty of champions in like their 40s. Okay, we've seen so much happen in, in the UFC. Not at these the, weight classes, but yes. No, yeah, not at these weight classes, but anything can happen. So I think he's still young enough to further excel his game. You know, being in the UFC now. Is only going to bring the best out of you. So I, I do think there is some upside there, but you know who knows? I will tank and put his lights out in thirty seconds, and then we're having a completely different conversation. Yeah, a hundred percent. Next up, I'm really pumped about this one, man. For for all the wrong reasons, we've got Norma Dumont going up against GDR Jermaine Derandemi out of Rotterdam. I I fucking love this fight. I'm gonna just be honest. I love this fight. And and not many people will, but I I I am feeling this. This is at Bantam Weight. Obviously, Norma Dumont making her return to Bantam Weight after her escapades fighting uh, women that didn't belong in the UFC. Uh, how do you feel? I'm gonna uh, uh, wait. Am I correct in saying this is you first? Why why am I like having a stroke right now? Is this are are you leading the dance on this one? I honestly don't yeah, remember. I, I swear. No, Did you I didn't. Talk I less? talked first. So yeah, this enjoy, Sean. You get you get my main event. How do you feel about this women's man's and weight matchup? <laughs> Honestly, this is a tough one to pick because, you know, I haven't seen Jermaine Durandame in almost, what, four years? I remember, I remember her last fight was my birthday, so I don't even know if I was turning 23 or 24 that year. And it's so wild. I'm turning 28 now, so that really tells you how long it's been. So I, this is tough, you know, like – with Norma in her last week class now back, I don't really know how to how I feel about her either. But I do feel like her grappling is is something that I can be. It's like a what's the word like um 
a significant disadvantage because of the reach. I think Durand May's reach is going to be stronger. I think her striking is going to be stronger uh, and, and more powerful. I keep if this fight stands, I if it's Jermaine from four years ago, then then I easily pick Durand May here. But I have no idea what this fight will hold because it's having her back on the roster is something I did not expect. And um, I don't know which fighter I'm getting yet. This is what happens when you have this such this much time in a layoff that I, I, you know, I'm not familiar with your game now. You know, I don't know what you've been up to these last four years. So if I see the Durand may of old or even 75% of it, I think uh, Durand may wins this one. So, as uncomfortable as I am picking it, I, I pick her based off the history of what I've seen. That fight against Amanda Nunez, whatever, five, six years ago. That is, you know, former champ in herself. It's She's got her history there. So if she's herself or close to it, I think she Dude, gets it. I love I, I loved listening to every second of that uh, because, God damn it, the Iron Lady is back ladies and gentlemen i'm gonna make this very clear i thought if there was anyone that i watched right that i actually actually legitimately believed while watching them fight this person that they can actually beat them it was gdr against amanda nunez in that five round fight man there was real moments there where it felt like not only was she able to beat amanda but that she could potentially knock her out on the feet gdr is dangerous man and I think serving as a as a police officer in the Netherlands, uh, trust me, she she's been fighting. You know what I'm saying? There, is, there, there's no there's no four four year layoff per se. Um, I thought I thought the odds here were just skewed in such a strange direction. So once again, just speaks to how sharp my co-host is that he already took all of my main points. Is that I was about to rattle off on on GDR, but I think Norma Dumont definitely does pose a different stylistic threat here. I think surprisingly um, at this stage of their career, she might be a little bit more physically imposing than GDR, despite having those intangibles, not necessarily going her way. Um, I think if they end up in the clinch for extended periods of time, I think Nomer Dumont might actually prove to be stronger there at this stage of their career. Uh, so that's something to really look out for in this matchup. Um, it's the ass, right? The, the, the ass is just, it, it anchors so much, um, especially up against the cage, right? When you, when you're pushing with that kind of force, um, and that kind of uh, equilibrium towards the fence, right? There's just so much uh, that can be accomplished. But at the same time, I agree with you. I think ultimately Jermaine is just so good at what she does. And all things considered, when you think about it, man, she choked out a future UFC champion in her last fight relatively effortlessly. That made us all feel like, yo, you know what? Juliana Pena really fucking sucks. And uh, that still might be true, right? <laughs> that thought still might be true. Um, but I think GDR is just a level above and Norma Dumont has been winning very effectively lately, but against a uh, second rate competition in the UFC to say the least. So I was just thinking too, that four of her last five fights have all been against mm -hmm. champions. Now looking back at it, Holly Holm, Raquel Pennington, Man Nunez and then Juliana Pena. And she's got wins in in four of those five. So, you know, but that's what I was saying, you know, like not to cut you off, but when you haven't seen someone in four to five years, you have no idea what you're getting. And, you know, this is gonna be a fun fight. That's why I slimly pick her. I know she's the underdog, but I I still think she can get it done. I love it. Next up. We've got a welter rate matchup that I'm really excited to talk about for many different reasons, but but one one being just a hilarious trope in MMA. So let me let me just rattle this off. Okay, we've got Court McGee going up against Alex Morono. Court McGee plus two forty five. Alex Morono minus three ten. I think all for good reason. But I, I just need to point this out because this is one of my favorite things in the sport. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here. How old do you think Court McGee is? Off the top. Just, just, just throw a number out there. Can't hear you, brother. You must be muted. I was muted. Sorry. Um, he's been fighting for a while, so I'm gonna say 36. Wow, very, very close. He is 38 years old, 
And now, now let me ask you this wow. question. How old do you think Alex Morono is? Oh, he's been he's been around a minute. I remember when he beat Donald Cerrone on like five days notice. That was so sad. I was heartbroken that day. Something um, you never thought to be possible I don't know. just a year before, literally. Yeah. Thirty five. <laughs> it makes sense why you would make that guess, right? Because this guy has been fighting the absolute graveyard in the UFC. This guy has been on the yeah. um the Anderson no no no. That's not even whoa. What am I saying here, brother? That was that was a terrible example. This guy has been on the retirement <laughs> tour where he's fighting all these older fighters as if he is old himself, but he is only 33 years old. <laughs> so this this man has been the old man hitman for the UFC for about five years now. That's right. He's been only matched up against fighters who are well past their prime because, and I, I'm just going to state it like this, athletically, he fights like someone that is their age. That That is why they have been matched up this way. And I think it's genius on the UFC's part, right? Because don't get me wrong. There's a lot of guys at 170 that will absolutely destroy Alex Morono, right? They're, seeing him at minus 310 just doesn't – it makes my skin crawl, right? It, it, there's, no, there's nobody that he should be that high of a favorite against just because – of his physical upsides. I actually could see court McGee out grappling and wrestling him here. Uh, despite the obvious, uh, routes to victory, which I'm sure we'll get into as well. Um, I'm picking Alex Morono to win here by knockout just because it's been, it's been real rough for court McGee, right? Shout out to court McGee. I love his story. I love everything that he is transparent about that he has been through. He is a MMA, um, staple, right? At this point in his career, someone that doesn't get, a lot of recognition for what he's been able to accomplish in his UFC career, despite also kind of not being a physical prospect in the same way that Alex Morono is. He's really accomplished a lot in the UFC. I encourage you guys to look back and check that out. But ultimately, I think Alex Morono, the great white hype, is just, is just too young at this stage of their careers, despite being an old 33 um, to lose to someone like Court McGee, hashtag bars. So give me Alex Morono. Alex Morono by first round, oh, easily. Fuck. First round, I'm just saying it right now. That's why. That's that's why it's minus three ten. Court McGee is is garbage. You're he's dog asshole, water. Bro. He's he's You're one asshole, of the worst. This, this really yeah. hurts. I try to I try to set it up as best as I could. Yeah, this this stage of his career is Court really, McGee is, is really dog water, bro. Dude, he's lost to literally everyone important. He's he's he has a sub 500 in the UFC and hey, he's been man. around hey, for forever. Hey. This is this is literally what Dana calls him for. He calls Morono in. Hey, another guy who just won't leave. We need that contract up. I know you're only an old 33, but you think you got it in you? Think you can knock this 39, 38-year-old out that shouldn't be in the UFC? We don't want to pay him anymore. We got to get him out of here. You know, that's that's what they call Morono in for. He is the Grim Reaper of all the retirees that just won't go away. And, uh, you know, this is just another one. Every time Morono faces someone, like, legitimately, like, good or on an upward path, he loses. He he loses. It's Chaos Williams, Anthony Pettis, uh, Ponzinibbio, Joaquin Buckley. Everyone else he'll absolutely destroy or win by decision, you know, and he does whatever he needs to on those guys that are on their way down. But those guys just a little bit, just a tiny bit of a trajectory upward. He can't beat them. So this is one of those where Court McGee is going like face first, head down, jumping from the, the top of a building. And this is where this is where Morono comes in, like licking his lips, like, yeah, this is this is my fight. Let me beat this old head up. And I'm gonna beat this guy up. Give me around two and a half minutes. I'm gonna do it real quick. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna predict. I'm gonna predict third uh first round, three minutes in. Left hook. I just gotta say, man, this shit makes me sad. Like, like you, you t clearly take a lot of sick pleasure in this shit. Like you like, you love, yeah, you oh, love, I love this seeing guys sent to the glue factory here. I, I don't, it, it hurts. I, I just gotta say, there's no world where Alex Morono has wins over people like Brad Tavares, over people like Robert Whitaker. These are tangible accomplishments that Court McGee has accomplished in his UFC career. But I get it. Yeah, this is this is bad. Um, I don't want it to happen the way you laid it out. 
I, I, I picked Alex Morono because I know it's what's gonna happen. But damn, bro, you ain't have to. You ain't have to make us feel like that. I just gotta say, it's okay. It's okay. So next up, <laughs> we have reached what I like to call, and I don't know about you, but I like to call peak MMA. We've got Trevor Peak going up against Charlie Campbell. Go ahead, Sean. Talk talk to us about your hatred for the, both of these guys. I don't have a hatred for him. I think I, I'm picking Trevor. Um, I just I just love underdogs. Is, I think this card. I'm just going with a lot oh. of underdogs here um, because I I picked a lot of favorites in my, in my last one and it only did it, it went to shit. So I'm I'm mm. changing it up here. But honestly, I'm going with Peak because of his uh, very very aggressive striking, and he's got pretty nasty knockout power. So. I think he's one of those where he's just going to jump at him, you know, ch- jump at Charlie right from the bell. And I see this one going. This could either be very, very quick, um, or you know, I, I the one thing that worries me about Trevor is getting to like how he's going to look after like the six, seven minute mark if he's not putting Charlie's lights out, you know, that early. So uh, that's the only thing that worries me is like how like how quickly he can be so explosive from up close, but. If that ends up failing, then that really worries me on what you know potentially could happen. So, I do think, I do think Charlie Campbell has like, you know, I know he's got a number of first round finishes, but I just see this one being more of Trevor Peak's fight and and his fight to lose. So I just see this one, this fight going Trevor Peak's way. But I wouldn't be surprised if Charlie pulls it out. But I, I do think Trevor has more than enough. I to love it. Stuff. And I'm going to put you on the spot here. Don't be ashamed. I just got to ask you. Did you see Charlie Campbell's fight on the Dana White Contender Series against Chris Duncan? Have it, is this a fight that sticks out to you in any way? It doesn't stick out, but I probably have Bro, seen it. I just I, remember it. For what, in my opinion, what Charlie Campbell has been able to accomplish after losing like that is fucking phenomenal. I'm going to I'm gonna just recap just so that it's in your mind as well. Uh, insane firefight back and forth early on in this fight where it looked like Charlie Campbell was about to knock Chris Duncan out. Like he, within the finishing sequence, he rocks Charlie. I mean, Charlie Campbell rocks Chris Duncan back onto the canvas in a way that looked like he was out entirely. Chris Duncan like scrambles to the feet and then just cracks him with a straight right that ends the fight like fucking insane insane Oh yes moment. yes 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 I have I seen this I think this is yes. the way Trevor Peak wins like 100%, 100% he's going to be getting cooked until he doesn't if he does win um I love that you're going with this pick because I think it is live to a certain extent but I really do believe in Charlie Campbell's uh development as a fighter I think no other moniker for my belief than me drafting the guy in his last fight right and i think he looked amazing against alex reyes obviously um the younger reyes brother between him and dominic um hate to see him go out like that because that was another brutal knockout uh for charlie campbell there but um i just feel like technically charlie campbell is worlds ahead of trevor peak and i think if he wants to he can be the manon fioro to the to his aaron blanchfield there's three references to last week's main event here um if he wants to he can just play on the outside and piece him up and not even put himself in danger by trying to knock him out i genuinely believe he has the skills to do that um but i think ultimately this is going to be a highlight real uh fight because of how trevor peak shows up to fight every time so uh, love him for that. Hate that he looks like the villain from Toy Story, but um, I'm going with Charlie Campbell 10 times out of 10, and I'm actually surprised that you are confident in peak MMA. But hey, this is fucking peak MMA, like you said. Next up, we've got Lucas Bresky going up against Walter Walker. I have i can't remember being this excited to break down a heavyweight fight on this show than I, than I feel right now. Uh, one Walter Walker, the brother of one Johnny Walker, the estranged brother of one Johnny Walker, which makes me even more excited about his prospects. So you're telling me that you're related to this man, but you're not involved with him. You're not you're not tainted by his uh, thinking <laughs> as far as <laughs> MMA and strategies. <laughs> are, are you serious? That That's an amazing place to be. Um, as a heavyweight prospect, man, this guy is just a fucking tank, right? And fighting out of 
one of uh, uh, the up and coming gyms that probably doesn't have the recognition that it deserves, Gore MMA, uh, where your favorite fighter, Shara Bullet, fights out of. Um, I think Walter Walker is a heavyweight prospect that we haven't really seen the likes of lately. And I say this because he's fought tough fights on the regional scene against um, actual fighters with a pulse, let's say that, that have grappling upside as well, right? That That's important to mention. Um, and he's looked great doing it, man. I will admit the only thing I don't like about his game because he's such a fucking oaf, right? So, so, such a, a huge dude out there. His strikes really do come at a downward trajectory, like a, a real downward angle uh, that makes me feel uncomfortable. I, I don't know what about it. It just makes, in my opinion, it makes him much more open and takes away some of his reach advantage. Um, in this fight, this dude is, a once again, just fucking huge and physically imposing for this weight class. I'm going to have a three-inch um, reach advantage here in a matchup where he's already also taller than his opponent. And let's be real, right? Lukas Breschke is is on his way um, to to the to the glue factory, right? This this is your kind of fight. This is your um, kind of matchup here. This is yeah. I, this is peak MMA. For funny enough, a couple uh, cards ago, you drafted someone with a similar name. And I don't know why I'm like, wait, did this man go up five weight classes? Like I, I had I no recollection of who Lekas Breschke was. And then I, and then I did my tape and I'm like, holy shit. Yeah, this is a guy. This is a guy that exists. Um, and, and, it, and this is a terrible fighter. Like, I'm going to be very real. Like, I don't, I don't see, uh, I don't see a path to victory here. I really don't like, I'm surprised that the odds aren't wider, but I guess this is heavyweight, right? Setting up Volta Walker to look good in his debut. Give me the second goofball on the rafter, Volta Walker. This is this is why this I say this to you. I think once a card, and, and many times during the numbered cards, where there's always a fight that the UFC just throws out there that you know promotes a certain fighter by giving them a dog shit fighter of their own to just absolutely annihilate. This is that fight. This is 100% that fight. Um, Breschke is garbage. Boudet, the fact that you lost to Boudet tells you in itself. But also losing to Waldo, that's like you just asked for the double. He, I, I don't even – did he even win in his in his Dana White fight? I thought he lost or, or had a no contest. I don't even remember him like – how did he get the contract? I don't get that. I, I know I know he got obliterated by Carl Williams. I remember that fight. But, like, wh what has he done to keep him here? So this is this is literally the glue factory fight. This is one of those where Walter comes in and kind of just jokes about this one and then just obliterates him. This is like the, you know, when you, when you see the boss battle before the end of, like, the movie or before the end of the video game, and you're getting, like, you, you, you think you have a chance, but they just laugh at you before they just absolutely annihilate you. This is that moment. This is what happens here. This is this is Walker's fight to just kill this man. And uh, and then hopefully I pray to whatever mixed martial arts legend is up there. Please don't put Breschke in another fight ever. Oh, have him retire ever. <laughs> Never again. I don't want to see this man. Please save him, not us. Holy shit! Him. This is gonna be bad. And I, I'm. I would have put this at minus nine hundred. That's how bad this fight's gonna be. This is gonna be a, a wallop of a fight. And Walker all day. I fucking love it. I love the enthusiasm. Next up, we've got Ignacio Bahamondes, one of my favorite fighters on the roster. God damn it. Going up against Christos Yagos, plus 270. Before you even say anything, I just got to say, um, did, did Christos Yagos fuck Dana White's wife or some shit? Like, what? why? Why? Why is he fighting a murderer's role always at 150? I mean, don't get me wrong. It's not hard to... It's hard to find an easy fight in this division, but holy shit, please, I encourage all of you guys, look at this man's fucking record, and look at who he's fought in the UFC. This guy is fighting everyone uh, that is good and on the way up. He is the cornerstone gatekeeper of lightweight, and goddammit, he gets shit done sometimes. So how you feeling, Sean? 
This one actually, I, I think this one will be a little bit closer than people think. But, and only because I say that because Bahamondas looked so bad in his last fight that I'm like concerned on how Bahamondas will look in this fight. And I, if, if Bahamondas looked anything like his former self, I would have easily picked Ignacio here. But I, I am still picking him. But I, I don't feel good about it because I don't know which – it's like the Kevin Holland thing with me. I say to you all the time, I don't know which fighter I'm getting at the moment. I don't know if I'm getting the Ignacio of two fights ago or the Ignacio of the last fight where I didn't even know it was him. So this is one where I I, I don't want to say, you know, Christos is a bad fighter. I think he's a, a mediocre fighter who That's tough. does a lot – to win i think he does a lot to win and but i just don't find him to be i don't like i i know i'm coming out with a lot of flames here and just fucking hurting people but i just don't see the x factor here i don't see it in christos here and i've seen it in ignacio in the past and then i don't know what the fuck happened to it so in this one i don't feel good about this at all but i think ignacio Gets it done. And to be completely honest with you, I'm rolling with what the betting odds are, are giving me. If they must see something that I'm not, so I'm going to feel comfortable not betting because I never win. And just just picking Ignacio for this fight. But if if this was no odds, I, I probably would end up picking Christos because of how bad Ignacio's last fight was. Dude, I'm really shocked by these takes. I'm going to be honest with you, and here's why. I think Christos Iagos is a very skilled fighter, despite not, not coming out on top in a lot of these fights. I mean, let's just be real. Uh, most recent losses, Tiago Moises, Daniel Zellhuber, and motherfucking Armand Sardukian. Like, th these are these are great fighters in the UFC. Literally, literally Dogs. great <sighs> fighters in the UFC. Um, and I thought he was winning that fight against Zell Huber before that happened as well. Um, I think he's a very well-rounded mixed martial artist, and I think that's where he could really give Ignacio a lot of trouble here. I agree. I think the line here doesn't really make sense to me. Um, but I do like Ignacio in this spot a little bit more than you do, and here's why. I think ultimately in fights like this where he's fighting someone that has what I would say is a clear like strength advantage in Christos Yagos, um, he can he can end up in trouble in some positions. And I think Ignacio Bahamonde is obviously going to be the faster guy out there. That's going to be where he needs to really find his advantages at range and uh, put himself in a position to really pot shot Yagos and not even let him get into the fight. Um, but I think, honestly, the more he's able to mix in grappling and the more he's able to make Ignacio work, this fight gets closer and closer, in my opinion. I think this is one that's definitely up there for like a live betting spot, right, where Ignacio comes out on fire in round one and shoots up to like a minus 700 minus 600 favorite and then you, you throw a little bit on christos and just watch him come back like i think that's this kind of fight i think ultimately christos has the deeper skill base in mma uh but also is a little bit more prone to making mistakes than ignacio mahamondes is i disagree with you on how he looked in his last fight though i just thought ludovic klein looked phenomenal um i thought he he came out and really uh took advantage of the advantages he had um, and really put forward a, a power uh, striking attack against someone that is mostly used to being able to rain on you, right? Versus uh, really stun you with the shots that he throws. Obviously, everyone's favorite highlight reel, love seeing that spinning hook, uh, hook kick knockout that he was able to get over one Roosevelt Roberts. Uh, but ultimately, I think Baja Mondes, one of my favorite fighters, someone that I would love to draft because honestly, I was surprised he was not on either of our uh, dynasty teams at this point of the game. Uh, you can double check that because I was shocked too. I thought I checked it like three times. Um, but I'm going with Ignacio, but I honestly really think this is a closer fight than it, than it is on paper. But we'll see how that plays out. Next up, we've at the top three. God damn it. There's only three fights left. We've got Morgan Charrier, my boy, my guy, going up against Chepe Mariscal. We've got, I love to see Chepe and Trevor Peak back on the same card, right? Uh, I wonder if they'll be hugging it out in the back. But um, how do you feel, Sean, 
about me starting the the analysis here, right? You like that? You like that? You thought I was gonna double dip you? Um, I'm going with Morgan Charrier. Obviously, I'm actually very surprised how close this line is, just because I think on the feet, uh, Morgan Charrier can be pressured a little bit, and I think that's where these lines sort of fall in place. I think if we end up in the grappling phases, Morgan Charrier is going to rip this guy's neck off. I genuinely believe that. Um, would love to see it get there. I think Chepe is scrappy and has a heart of a fucking lion, right? This is one of your guys. This is Viva Mexico. Let's fucking go, right? Like, this is, this is once again, um, one of your guys. I can see if you end up going the other way totally. I understand why. Because, uh, Chepe, you just got to represent. You know what I'm saying? You got to represent. But ultimately... I think as far as this matchup goes, Morgan Charrier is the bigger prospect, the more um, technical fighter of the two, the more willing to stick to a game plan. (laughs) Um, I could see, obviously, Chepe goading him into a brawl and things getting ugly. Um, But I think even in a fight like that, man, I've seen this guy battle tested, especially in Cage Warriors before he's got here to the UFC. So give me Morgan Charrier. You know, it's just because you said that I was going to pick Morgan, but I just want to keep this different. Give me, give me Chepe here. You know what? I'm taking Chepe here and I'm just going to randomly say why. Um, Because I think Chepe is one of those very rare fighters in the entire UFC. I would say this probably in the top 10%, I would say, I I, I don't want to name a hundred million people that will literally fight for 15 straight minutes as hard as he can, no matter what, like getting killed or not, he will always fight. And, you know, I know with with Chepe having that win over Jenkins and breaking his arm, whatever, I felt like that was a little on the luckier side, but even still, I think he's super, super competitive. He's, he's not someone I'm, I'm considering a great fighter. I think he's an above average fighter, I think even Charrier is better, but I think, you know, he can counter Charrier's like very aggressive striking. And I see this one, this could be one of those where it's kind of back and forth. And uh, I think this one's actually a lot closer than, than I was going to pick. Cause I, like I said, I was going to pick Morgan. So I'm flipping it because I think this is going to be a very close fight that I think comes down to that third round. And I think it's one of those, you know, fights that go down the third round. I can absolutely see Chepe kind of stealing this one. And uh, because of, you know, my blood and everything, I'm going to Damn, pick dude. Chepe. I'm not going to lie. You made a great case, even though that wasn't <laughs> the case you planned to make. Good shit, brother. Next up, uh, I love that you're starting with this one because I've got a lot to say and it's not a lot of nice things. We've got Alexander the Great Hernandez, um, the world's favorite prospect at one point. Back at 145, uh, going up against Damon Jackson. Go ahead, Sean. How do you feel about this co-main event? I only am picking. Uh, they're both two mediocre fighters, right? Like, uh, can is it? Can maybe I'm wrong? I just don't think they're as good as they once were. Uh, Hernandez was once supposed to be the next big thing at, at once upon a time. Um, but I do think that um, Damon Jackson excels in grappling and submissions, has a pretty f- pretty good fight IQ. Um, but I do think Hernandez is, you know, is so much more dynamic. You know, he can he has the ability to control the fight. I think he is a little uh, what's the word? I think he is a little overbearing, and I think he could do a little too much at times. But I don't see a way where Hernandez, with all the the peak performance that I've seen from him, I don't see him losing to someone like Damon Jackson here. I I just – this isn't a fight that I'm comfortable in, but because I have it, you know, him on my dynasty, I I can't go against my dynasty twice. And um, I don't feel comfortable about it. This is – there's like two or three fights in this whole car that I haven't felt too comfortable with. And this is one of them. This is two mediocre fighters where anything can happen. And uh, you know, I think her I think um Hernandez's susceptibility to susceptibility to being grappled and submitted is a problem for me. But I still think Hernandez can get it done with the power in his hands. 
if he is, you know, the old Alexander Hernandez, and uh, I think he can slip away with the victory here, and I'm, that's why I'm picking Damn. him. I fucking love it, dude. I love the analysis. Just phenomenal. I just got to say, just phenomenal. Um, these are the people who have knocked out Damon Jackson. Are you ready to hear this list? Because I was surprised when I when I read it. Let's hear it. So one of his losses is to Yancey Medeiros, where he was uh, bulldog choked. That was a mm. long time ago, back at UFC 177. Goddamn. 2014 vibes. Then... He lost via punches to Kevin Aguilar, a fighter that I loved coming into the UFC that never really panned out. He lost via flying knee to Movlid Habalaev in PFL. And then he lost to Ilya Toporia and Dan Ige by stoppage. Though that that's a very legitimate list of people. I just gotta say that. I don't think yeah. uh, Alexander Hernandez has the striking chops of any of those guys that i just named i i legitimately do not so i'm going with damon jackson here i'm a big fan of his doggedness and his ability to like billy quarantello right make you beat the shit out of him until you're tired right like like let's box car homer this let's get beat up a little and then uh by the time you start realizing oh shit this guy's not going anywhere now i'm coming downhill on you motherfucker um i think that's this kind of matchup I think Alexander Hernandez has all the tools to win this fight and should win this fight by knockout. Like, I'm just making that very clear. Physically, who he is, um, he should be able to put it together. But some something's just not there for him, man. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a mental thing. He seems to have all the physical gifts necessary. But I think he's the perfect example of someone that you don't always necessarily win off of a win, right? Yeah, he definitely knocked out Benil Dariush in shocking fashion that sticks in all of our minds to this day. But from that point on, so much was put ahead of him because of what he was able to accomplish there that he's never really been able to find his footing in the UFC since then, right? He's, this is a second weight class now where he has multiple losses uh, to fighters that are not necessarily the top of the division. So it's just... Once again, you, you look at both of these guys coming off the motherfucking bus and it's like, yeah, I'm definitely going with Alex Hernandez here. Um, but ultimately, I think Damon Jackson is just the dog that we need uh, to make Alexander Hernandez wilt out there. So give me Damon Jackson. I, I will say it, I, I have believed I always feel like there's certain fighters that just change in, in, because of a fight. Like how Uriah Hall, when he had that that, I think it was during the either contender series or the contender series didn't exist then. During uh, tough, when he had that spinning back kick and knocked that dude out, like even though he won, I think Uriah Hall changed that day and was never the same fighter again. And I think with for Alexander Hernandez, I feel like when he talked all that shit to Donald Cerrone. And he really thought he was just going to walk past that old man, like he kept saying, and you know, and finish him. And I think the way he lost so easily Dominant. due to like the, the veteran experience of Donald. Donald kept his composure the whole time and just pieced him up the whole fight. And I think from that moment, he was a completely changed fighter. Like he after that, after that first five minutes of fighting Donald, I think he went from being this overconfident and thinking he really can walk this whole division to, holy shit, I'm nowhere close to the veteran uh, of Donald Cerrone, who, you know, was uh, sort of on the way down by that point. And, you know, that I think that changed him from there on out. Like, yeah, he, I think he won his next fight, but I, I, I just, he's never been able to build off that. And I think since that moment, he's never been the same. And, um, while I don't expect much more from him, I do think he barely slips away. Dude, I just got to say that was fucking phenomenal. Every second of that from the Uriah Hall comparison to this, phenomenal, right? F fucking A-plus grade for you there, brother. That was, that was great analysis. I agree with you 100%. I feel like the only good thing that came out of that fight was that day drinking Don line, right? Like, that was actually pretty good. I'm not going to lie. I remember hearing that. Like, ah, oh, right, that's a good one. Um, and, and Cerrone was legit pissed off by that. Like he was, he, you could tell he was very angry about that shit. Yeah. 
Uh, it's always weird to me to see someone get shit talked and just not do anything. Like, just be like, hmm, yeah. Like, just get really angry. Like, it's always <laughs> very strange. I don't know if it's just a New York thing that we're just used to, like, busting balls, right? It's we're a New York ready, thing. We're, we're ready to, to, to yeah. fire back. This this man was just like, okay. Uh -huh. And then came out the next day like a fucking serial killer. You love to see it. And shout out to that Uriah Hall mm -hmm. reference because it's almost like a you, you knock out this guy and then a part of your soul leaves your body. Like, this, I have a different responsibility now because I can do this to people. Like, I didn't know that I could alter human beings' lives uh, by 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 taking them by separating from them from their consciousness in a way that is irreparable to their health. Like I I feel like the danger of what he was able to pose on these people was was just too much for Uriah Hall. And uh, you might be onto something with the parallel with Alexander Hernandez. Just fucking I couldn't have asked for a better fucking co-host. Next up, Brendan Allen versus Chris Curtis. God damn it, this is a rematch. This is the second time we get to see this fight and I love it because this is a completely different rendition of it. Um, the odds minus 200, uh, for Brendan Allen plus 170 for Chris Curtis, the man that won by knockout in the first fight, a huge underdog. I don't agree with the lines here. I think ultimately, um, this is Chris Curtis's fight to win. I think, I mean, to lose, I think if Chris Curtis allows himself to not um, allows himself to be pressured here and to not take the initiative of this fight, he's going to lose. Like, I'm going to make this very clear. If he doesn't secure the initiative early and often in this fight, he will lose to Brendan Allen. Brendan Allen has made substantial changes. I mean, I loved going back uh, just a little to key you in on how I prepared for this. I watched uh, his the rematch. Well, I watched the original fight first before I even looked at any of their most recent fights. And then I watched their last two fights. And man, it's just crazy to see how much Brendan Allen has grown as a fighter. Um, his willingness to put volume out before committing to a strike, like what he's able to do when putting guys on the back foot. Phenomenal to see that kind of the skill development, right? Like, honestly, you could watch this fight with Chris Curtis. You could watch a couple of fights in his early UFC career and be like, man, this is a completely different guy. And, and it's legitimate. Like this, this guy has really turned around his career and really become a different threat um, in all phases of the game, which you love to see, man. That's one of my favorite things uh, to see. Not only fighters fulfill their potential, but fighters that are not thought of as good. Like, and and to really turn it around in, in a 360 way is fucking inspirational. Um, I think ultimately, though, I kind of still feel like Chris Curtis should be the favorite here. I think there's a certain level of uh, PTSD that exists when you get knocked out like that. Um, I'm really interested to see if Brendan Allen can keep this up, right? If he can have that fire in his belly, if he can be confident to pressure Chris Curtis in this fight, I think he deserves that minus 200 tag, man. This guy has all the grappling upside. We saw him get Chris Curtis's back in round one in a very, very slick, dangerous scenario where he could have potentially submitted him and got him out of there. He had his back for almost a minute before the, the first round ended. And I thought that was a, a real key to, to where they lie in the grappling phases of things. So, that once again, this is why I need to stress, this is Chris Curtis's fight to lose. If he does not put pressure on Brendan Allen in this fight, he will get overwhelmed and eventually submitted. That's that's what I'm going with. That's what I'm picking. I'm going with Brendan Allen here. And I love that you drafted him. You put the nuts on the table and you just made it clear. Like, I see what's going on here and I like it. And I think you made the right choice, man. I think ultimately, I like both of these guys. I just really have not seen development in Chris Curtis's game in a little bit, which is sad for me to see. I'm a big fan of Chris Curtis and also what he's been able to accomplish being written off so many times and ultimately always showing like he's a fucking dangerous guy out there. But um, I just think he's really small for middleweight. And I think he has an issue with um, assuming that things are going to go his way eventually. So it's just okay to let things build in a negative way during fights. And I think against someone like Brandon Allen, that's going to be fucking trouble. Once again, I already kind of laid out his case and his path to victory. I think he could definitely stun Brandon Allen even late into this fight and knock him out. Like I won't be surprised by that at all. Um, I just feel like the way Chris Curtis fights, he kind of expects things to fall into place eventually. And he's just fine with that. And I think in the last couple of fights that has really sort of fell to his disadvantage and led to him losing. So I'm 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 going Brendan Allen here. 
Yeah, I I'm picking. Well, you took a lot of my points there. So to keep it as simple as I can, because I feel like I'm just going to repeat what you just said. Uh, yeah, I'm picking Brendan Allen. And the reason I picked him in Dynasty was because I felt that he had gotten a lot better um, since the first fight. And the fact that Chris Curtis taking this on short notice, that is always, you know, an issue. I, I, you know, a lot of people do win on short notice, but I always feel that the fighter who takes the fight on short notice is always, you know, and on never given the upper hand. And I think Brendan Allen has gotten so much better in the grappling and the submission game. He's actually become like a serious threat. And I remember, you know, with the Brendan Allen, Paul Craig fight that we had, you know, a couple months back, where I thought for a hot second, I, I picked Brendan Allen to win, but I thought with Paul Craig being a more physically dominant guy, that it was going to be more of a, a tougher fight for Allen to be able to keep and get the submission. But you convinced me during that podcast that you were saying that Brendan Allen's ground game would be way too much for Paul Craig. And I feel that's the exact same thing we got here. Chris Curtis is an incredible striker. His resilience is probably you know top 10 in the whole UFC. But I do feel that if he doesn't, like you said, overwhelm him so you know early on and have Brendan Allen constantly going backward, um, you know, this is completely Brendan Allen's fight. And, you know, I think Chris Curtis has to be so dangerous to him from the from the jump that, you know, keeping Brendan Allen on the back foot, giving him no, no opportunity to even attempt the striking, to only go for the grappling, that Chris Curtis is there prepared for it and is waiting for the takedowns, waiting for the grapple game, and, you know, is able to to counter or, you know, to to slip away. And that's where Curtis can thrive. But I think Brendan Allen, where if Brendan Allen is able to take him down or even grapple with him to the point of, you know, you're in Brendan Allen's game, I don't see a way where Chris Curtis can find his way out of it. It's almost like, you know, like a like an animal, like a predator finding his prey. It's almost like once he has you, you're almost like it's like inevitable. And this is one of those situations. And if Chris Curtis had a full camp, maybe I would have thought differently and maybe thought this would have been a little bit closer. But because Curtis has taken this on short, no short notice, which I commend him for, man, that's to win the first fight and now you're taking him on short notice. Like, you don't have to do that. Granted, I know Brendan Allen, his stock is much higher. So if you take this and then you win it, Chris Curtis's stock rises through the roof here because not only is you beating him once, but you beat him twice. And where Allen's, you know, was rising throughout this division. So, you know, there's plenty of upside here for both. You know, Allen can write this loss and move forward. And Curtis can beat Allen twice and just say, listen, I beat Brendan Allen, one of the, you know, biggest names in, in this division. You know, give me a, you know, a, a top 10, top five guy now. So this is a big fight. Um, this is a, a great main event. I do look forward to it. Um, but I do think Allen will be more than capable to handle Curtis in the grapple game um, and be able to get around, around, I would say around two submission, maybe even round Dude, three. I fucking missed this, bro. I mean, this, this was, a, this was phenomenal. Chef's kiss, bro. Me too, this bro. was amazing. Uh, and I, I'm glad you made that point at the end too, because all I could think about while you were saying this is like, damn, it sounds like we fucking hate Chris Curtis. And honestly, I think we both got a lot of love for both of these guys. Like, I feel like their path in the sport and what they've been able to accomplish is just inspirational. Once again, both of them. Like, I'm a, I'm a big fan of both of these guys. Uh, despite how much Lou Betcha hates Chris Curtis and wants to have a street fight with them, we can try to align that. Hopefully, in the future, I would love to see that. Uh, still, I would favor. Uh, Lou Betcha, of course, um, always on the streets of Philly. But all things considered, uh, Chris Curtis is a goddamn dog, too. And once again, I love his camp. I love everything about both these guys. I think this is a uh, phenomenal fight and a phenomenal rematch, which is going to give us a completely different story than the first fight. Um, and I think even if Chris Chris Curtis wins, like you said, it's a it's a new story on that knockout because it's not going to be you knocked out that same guy. We got to keep that same energy, right? And if we're going to talk about how good Brandon Allen's gotten, it's only right to respect that if Chris Curtis was to able to overcome the challenge once again. But uh, fuck, man, we got some fights, and I'm looking forward to them. God damn it! Uh, with all that being said, we move on to our favorite part of the show it's dynasty mma baby so we got some updates to make right i think 
we we kind of skipped over this early and I, I I said fuck it we're going right in um, but I think it's important that we give our updates on the standings for 2024 because even though we haven't been here uh, we've still been keeping up with our dynasty keeping up with our head to head picks every single week if we want, want access to the doc we'll send it to you right there's no reason for us to uh, fucking misconstrue these stats but ultimately last week was a very good week for me in the head to head I got four matchups <laughs> against you head to head that went my way which felt fucking amazing um, and I finished the night 10 and two, bringing my head to head record to 88, 46 and three, uh, while you, what, what we were previously, uh, one point a- away, you ended up going seven and eight last week, um, finishing with your head to head record being 84 wins, 52 losses and three, <clears throat> no contests. Uh, so we've got that all laid out and uh presented i think it's really cool that up to this point we've gotten three uh no contests should have been four last week um and guess what um we've got no draws yet in 2024 so something to keep an eye out for i wonder if uh, we end up getting that this year i mean this week um but as far as dynasty mma goes i think i'm really excited to do this recap as well because you're kicking my ass in 2024 god damn it uh last week you really brought it very close not only with uh obviously killing me in 2024 but also um bringing things back in the entire dynasty head to head so ultimately i was able to stretch a little further ahead this week um but our 2024 standings are as follows after last week i went two and two you went two and two three and one um with obviously victoria uh due to COVID not competing <laughs> so that that is a thing um but all things considered your record for 2024 is 31 21 losses and one no contest while mine of course has all three no contests <laughs> that happened this year and i am 31 wins 23 losses so we're right there neck and neck once again um, my win percentage sitting at 54.39 and yours is at 58.49 for the year and then our dynasty head-to-head totals sit as follows so i am at 78 wins 47 losses and two Two draws, four no contests, leaving me with a win percentage of 59.54, while you are sitting with a record of 77 wins, 51 losses, one draw, and two no contests, which brings your record win percentage to 58.78. So once again, closer than it's ever been last week. This week, I I inched ahead a little bit more. Uh, but very respectable comeback in the dynasty totals for you there, buddy. And it's only right that you kick us off in our dynasty draft this week with that all being said. Ooh, Ooh I forgot I went first. <laughs> uh, all right. All right. All right. All right. Um, I feel like we both know who I'm going to go with here. Um, Lucas Breschke. I know. Yeah, no, Cynthia Calvillo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. I guess to I'm, I'm only taking my time here so I can prepare for my last pick. You know I have two picks to um, make in the interim, correct? Yeah, yeah, I know. I know, buddy. All right. Sure I'm going to go with... Uh... <sighs> Purposely taking my time. Give yeah, me, I give me Matsumoto here. There was any need for any sort of <laughs> uh, extrapolation there? That was very clear. You, you had to, you had to take. Yeah, I had was, to take my was, time. That hurt. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is where things get interesting. I think ultimately, I was excited about both oh, of yeah. these guys coming in. So fuck it. Give me Ignacio Bahamondes and give me one Walter mm. Walker. Once again, I am. Wow. I am the brother, the brother lover. Uh, let me make sure. Wait, no, actually, you actually brother you have Johnny lover. Walker, so I might have to figure out a way to trade wow, that's, trade that's you messed um, up. for this scenario. But give me Volter, goddammit. Go ahead and make your second pick because there's nobody else that's good on this board. <laughs> yeah, this isn't this isn't ideal here by the way we um, caught up in dynasty way faster than i even realized like every week we have three fighters oh yeah. at least usually this week i have two you have three 
Uh, we're, we're we're catching up. God damn it. Yeah. Um, this isn't. This is not an easy fight to pick. Um, give me. You know, what I'm just realizing right now. Wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. Give me Court McGee. <laughs> you know, you didn't even believe that either. No, I didn't. I don't. I'm not a fan of this right now. But uh, give me, give me, give me Victor Hugo. Okay. I don't like it, but it has a little bit of upside here. I like it. I like it. We we did a damn thing. God damn it. It feels good once again to be back. I just got to make that clear. I love this. I love uh, getting through a full episode and finishing looking at the Dynasty prospects. It just gives us, always gives us a lot to look forward to on fight night. Uh, but once again, just a lot to look forward to for the rest of the year, man. We got UFC 300 right around the corner. We're going to be doing two episodes oh, yeah. covering ufc 300 going in depth really excited to jump into that very soon hopefully this week we, we got to talk about that sean um but all things considered once again make sure that you're showing support to the show god damn it make sure you're following the brand at ots media co on all social just look at this fucking unprofessional swine on all social media platforms <laughs> and OTS media on YouTube. And then once again, ladies and gentlemen, make sure that you're following my guy, Sean, on his socials. Make sure that you're checking out the website so you can see all the content that he and I are going to be producing moving forward. Uh, but all things considered, Sean, is there anything else you want to say before we get out of here? UFC 300, baby. One week away. I'm excited. All the hype. And I think, and this is the other thing, too, where we, we have some exciting stuff to talk about. Um, there's going to be, I, I feel there's going to be some uh, breaking news sort of stuff happening at UFC 300. So I'm very excited. Uh, we'll talk about it. We'll have, you know, segments and episodes about it. But I can't wait, brother. This is going to, this is the beginning to a very exciting Hell yeah, year. man. Uh not the beginning. This is the peak, right? We we're reaching the the moment on Nitro right before that drop hits. We're we're right there right now, and I think there's nothing more fitting than the fact that these pieces of shit gave us a hellscape card right before, right? Just to remind us that hey, you might be getting good things, but that doesn't mean that we want good things for you. So remember that, ladies and gentlemen. Until we get out of hellscape, until we get out of hellscape together, right? Because we can't do it alone. We've been through eleven thousand of these events already, and then ten to boot. There's 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 a level of constitution that I have lost months ago for these fucking height fights being taking place in a warehouse where some uh, white whale gambler is the only person that can afford the three seats are, that are there and is fucking jacking off onto the side cage links during the middle of these fights. This is this is this is what the UFC loves and loves to look forward to. But I promise one day, ladies and gentlemen, single handedly because of this show. UFC Hellscape will come to an end. But until then, remember, UFC don't give a fuck about you or the fighters. See you next week. <laughs>